Um, Today, I'm going to talk to you about VM to, com to VM communication mechanism for embedded. Um, and you, if you're familiar with uh, virtualization or virtualization technologies, well, actually, we have been discussing um, IO virtualization and VM to VM communication for a very long time, more than 10 years, maybe more than 20 years. You know, Xen PB drivers, Vertio, they now have been around for a very long time. So what's actually new about it? Why we're even here discussing it? The purpose of this talk is to uh, talk to you about how virtualization in embedded is different from virtualization in the data center. And in fact, uh, we, can do, we t tend to call it static partitioning rather than virtualization. And how these requirements are not different also for communication and IO virtualization. Um, and to show you how they affect existing communication protocols and whether we, you know, asking the question of whether we need new ones. Uh, and if so, uh, how do the new protocol look like? What are the requirements? Um, so let me start from what is already out there that probably you are already familiar with, or at least you have already heard of. Uh, there are Xen PV drivers, there, are, there is Birtio. Both of them are discoverable and dynamic. So the purpose of them is so that at runtime you can detect and use new uh, paravirtualized I.O. You can hot plug new uh, paravirtualized I.O. devices. Um, it's also meant to be able to create connection at runtime. So it's not like you define statically who can communicate with what. And it's, it's made for I.O. virtualization rather than VM to VM communication. So think about it. The purpose of these protocols were, uh, was so that a VM fully abstracted, running in the cloud, can have access to the network, access to the disk, without knowing where it's running, whether it's one server or another server, one cloud provider or a different cloud provider. And ideally, so abstracted that you can even live migrate one VM from one server to the other. This is extremely different from what we do in Embedded. In Embedded, we know exactly what's running where. We are not building a generic VM. We are building a purposely built and designed environment for one specific partition we know beforehand. And also, we are not trying to communicate with who knows what. We are communicating with a neighbor, right? With another partition on the same SOC. We are not likely even going to go outside the SOC. What this means is a lot of the optimization and uh, configuration parameters and choices, design choices made for these protocols, uh, they are sometimes even counterproductive for uh, embedded. But let's go into how they are designed. So uh, I'm going to try to use common terminology uh, so that it applies to both. There is a front-end driver in, uh, the, in the unprivileged VM. In, in the Xen world, we call it DOM U, U for unprivileged. Uh, that is just your regular Linux driver creating a virtual network card, a virtual block device. It's connecting to a special driver that we call backend. Uh, so in Vertio, that's typically called VMM. It's really a proxy. What this guy is doing is receiving connection from the front end and then connecting to the real device. So proxying access to the real device underneath. Um, so uh, a couple of interesting uh, details about this is these protocols are typically made, uh, are typically based on memory sharing rather than memory copying. This is an important detail because if you have any safety requirement, sometimes memory sharing is not allowed. Um, finally, uh, Vertio expects uh, today privileged backends. What does it mean? It means that in order to share memory, the backends need to be able to map any page the guest passes to the, to the backend, which needs full privilege, and which is another thing that you might not um, have the ability to grant to the backend if you have any safety requirement. OK, so now before we go into uh, what are the specific requirements that we have in static partitioning scenarios, and uh, I'm going to go through five different ways to do VM to VM communication today. So please bear with me. <laughs> but before we go into that, I, I was going to spend a couple of, couple of words on what is static partitioning. Uh, and what are the requirements of static partitioning so that at least we start from, uh, from common ground. Um, 
So static partitioning is similar to virtualization, uh, and many of the underlying hardware capabilities are the same, such as uh, on ARM, is the EL2 execution level, it's gonna be used in both. Uh, probably we call hypervisors a piece of software that does both things. But the implementation is usually very different. So in one case, it's about dynamic VM, packing as many as you can on a single host. In the other case, it's about dividing up your board into few partitions that you define statically beforehand. So in static partitioning, the focus is not much about running many, many VMs. The focus is running few VMs, which typically are called also partitions, and directly assigning hardware to these partitions. So direct assignment is usually uh, key. Um, configuration is defined at build time. So when I say build time, I don't necessarily mean Yocto, and so Yocto could be the place to do it. I mean before you turn on your target, right? So before you even power on your target board, you already know how many partitions you're gonna get. You're gonna get three, you're gonna get four, you're gonna get five, but you definitely know in the case of on a server, can you manage? Can you imagine there are gonna be hundreds? You, you don't even know, you have no clue what's gonna be running there because it's all dynamically deployed. Finally, um, last but not least, there are three requirements that often come either all of them together or at least you're gonna get one of them in embedded static partitioning that certainly data center don't have to meet at all. One of which is real time. That are very, very common in embedded. You have some sort of real time, if not proper real time, at least deterministic RQ latency. Another requirement is short boot times. So, uh, you know, I, I usually joke that if, when you turn on the radio on your, on your car, you don't want to wait three minutes for your BIOS to boot, right, on your server, right? It has to be instantaneous, right? Um, and, um, the safety is often also a requirement. When I say safety, that means a lot of things, right? It can mean safety certification, so proper ISO 26262 at some ISO level, but sometimes it's just um, safety in the sense of you are designing it so that if one component fails, that's the only, that the failure is limited, that's the only component that's gonna fail. It's not gonna bring down everything. Uh, so that could, I still call it safety, also maybe it's not a proper safety certification that you're looking at. You're just, look, you're just designing to, to be able to tolerate failure. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give us an example, uh, Xandom Zeroless. So typically the software that you're gonna use for server virtualization is very different from the software that you're gonna use for static partitioning. Uh, because simply the characteristics are too different, uh, but Xen is an exception. So Xen can be configured for data center or can be configured for static partitioning, uh, and depending on how you, you configure it, you get either one. And the configuration for static partitioning is DOM zero-less. We call it DOM zero-less because DOM zero is a privileged environment uh, that is the first one to start on Xen, the one where you do privilege operation, you manage VMs, start, stop VMs. Well, with DOM zero less, DOM zero is not needed anymore. You can even stop it entirely from running. So, so don't think that with DOM zero less you necessarily don't have a DOM zero. DOM zero become optional, and that's why it's called DOM zero less because it's not necessary, it's not required anymore to get things up and running. So how does it work? You load all the kernel, RAM disk, everything that you need from U-Boot, and then you let Xen start uh, everything in parallel. So you parallelize the boot, uh, and typically uh, if yellow or purple are bare metal VMs or, or tiny RTOSes, yellow and purple will finish the boot way, way before DOM0 or any Linux environment. What it means is you can get your motor controller application on your Artos up and running in far less than a second. And when I say this, you know, it might be possible to achieve even with, even with Linux, there have been demo in the past, but here I mean by, by with a pretty much default configuration, right? Without having to push any limits, you're gonna get a, you know, a second about, you know, of boot time to your motor controller application. So, um, how does it work? The static, partition, the static partitions here, the VMs, yellow, purple, DOM0, are defined at build time, and again, when I say build time, I don't actually mean when you're calling GCC, I mean before you turn on your system. 
uh, you get fast boot time, real time support with the null scheduler, which basically is a, is, a, is a scheduler that does nothing. That's why it's called null scheduler, so you get real time and no scheduling. Uh, it's easier to safety certify because if you take away DOM0, then you only need to safety certify the hypervisor component, which is a lot, a lot smaller. DOM0 is not required. And here is the thing there is no out of the box communication mechanism. And this is where the interesting part of the talk begins. So, why? Because DOM0 less is, after all, a pure static partitioning solution. So, what it does is you draw partition on your board. And basically, each environment is one of those partitions, and that's it. It's statically divided. There is no shared anything, no communication, nothing. So how do we go about adding communication mechanism to, uh, to DOM zeroless? Um, or what is the best communication mechanism among the many technologies I'm going to talk to you about? So the first thing is to recognize, and maybe this is the most important message of this talk, is VM to VM communication is actually different from device virtualization. So protocol like Vertio Net or Vertio Block or Xen PV drivers were meant to share a block device, a network card, the console, graphic devices across multiple VMs. While here, at least in my experience working in embedded, most of the time we don't want, share, we want, we don't want to share anything at all. Because after all, you are dividing at the board on purpose so that each partition gets entirely different devices. But what you only need is a way for this partition to exchange data. Exchange data for logging so that you can send, send them up to the cloud so that you can do further processing. But usually, it's just about data exchange rather than I.O. virtualization. Now, this is actually a different goal, right? And it can be, it, it is optimized differently. So you don't need a full network virtualization solution to just get two partition to exchange data, right? Um, on the other end, there are cases where you might need uh, I.O. virtualization. And I can make a very simple example, which is um, even if you have two or three partitions, uh, which are completely independent, and each device is assigned uniquely, there is often the need to share an SD card among them. Because typically, you only have one SD card on your board. You want to set up different partition on your SD card, one for each part static partition, one for each VM and use them one partition or LVM volume in each VM. That requires block virtualization, a block device virtualization. So in other words, uh, if you only need VM to VM communication, the requirement is a lot simpler. And in my experience, that is the most common requirement. IO virtualization is not as needed in embedded, but still, if you need it, it's best addressed with an I.O. virtualization solution rather than to a VM to VM communication channel. The other interesting bit is uh, that in embedded, um, for safety, you often need to be able to define this VM to VM communication channel statically. Right? So having them dynamic actually is counterproductive because when you go and do safety certification, you need to go and explain how one can communicate with two, but three cannot communicate with four. And it's a lot easier to do it if the channel is actually static, right? rather than created dynamically. Um, and finally, no privileged backends for, for the same reason for safety, it's often totally impossible to run privileged backends. Because if your backend, backends were privileged, then you will need to safety certify them as well, which it basically usually is a, is a no-go. There is one more thing that is, in the data center, when you have compatibility for Linux, Windows, BSDs, you are done. In embedded, this is far from the truth, right? There is Zephyr and Free Artos and so many Artoses. I cannot remember half of them. And, and Bare Metal and the Wind River, QNX, and yeah, the, the partner list of Xilinx alone is more than a dozen companies. I can't remember them all. 
Okay, so the, problem, the point is portability. So I, I think it's, it's a given your, your driver are not gonna be available for all the systems that you would like, right? So portability of this code is essential so that you can get them up and running yourself on your esoteric Artos, popular at the moment, and without a huge amount of effort, right? Uh, so no privilege backend, how do they look like? You, you just run the backend in another normal VM by first assigning the hardware device to the normal VM and then running the proxy, so the backend there. And simply DOM0, you take it out of the picture, just for your reference. Okay, now the, back, the background is done and I'm gonna move into your, you know, a, a, a list of uh, four or five technologies and trying to explain to you in the most objective way possible the pros and cons. And I'm telling you straight away, there is no single winner here. I'm not trying to say, just use this and you're gonna be good, because it's not true. It's simply not true, right? There are too many dimensions, too many configurations. It, there, is, there is no one that wins them all. So depending on your, on your requirement, one will, might, be, might be better than others. I'm gonna start with the granddaddy of the IO virtualization world that is at least in open source the oldest technology of this, which is Zen PV drivers. They've been around for a very long time and they've been uh, battle hardened in production for many years uh, from AWS to many other products. So they certainly, uh, they certainly work well. Uh, they are made for, again, IO virtualization. So you might use them for VM to VM communication, but it was, no, it was never the original goal. The goal was, uh, IO virtualization, and they come with support for network, block, console, graphics, 2D graphics, sound, and others. What are the pros of ZenPV drivers? Well, among the solutions you're gonna see here, ZenPV driver are the fastest with unprivileged backends. Why? Because ZenPV drivers were designed for unprivileged backends. So you know that all the optimization and the performance that you get in DOM0, the number are gonna be identical if you move them to an unprivileged VM. Um, the other pros is available for Linux, BSD, and Windows out of the box. The fact that they are available as BSD, uh, NetBSD and FreeBSD, means you can port them to um, FreeRTOS or whatever environment that uh, you, you like to port them to without a huge amount of effort. So it's not like you have to start from scratch, you can start from the BSD implementation. Cons um, might not be available, well, that's the same thing, right? It might not be available for RTOSs. I think this is generally true for all of the we're gonna discuss here. Uh, but, uh, and DOM0 support is available in the sense that I'm gonna demo it today for the first time at the end of the talk, but um, it's not upstream yet. Uh, so it's work in progress and it's a brand new development uh, that I'm gonna show you, uh, that I'm gonna show you today. How does it work? Uh, PV driver support for DOM zero less. So uh, you start your VMs in parallel as usual with DOM zero less. Then uh, you, do, you use a little tool in DOM zero once become available to start the communication channel between your DOM U's. So it creates a connection between yellow and purple so that they can start um, the P PV protocols for network block or whatever it is that you need. So that means, in a way, you can think about the boot sequence as a two stages boot sequence. So your yellow or purple environment, we are, they're gonna still come up incredibly quickly, but without PV network or PV block support. They're gonna come up immediately and you can immediately start your motor controller application. However, PV block or network or whatever it is that you need is gonna come up a little bit later when the DOM0 tools are available, when purple is available, when everything else is available, the connection will gonna come up. And the total time to get your connection up is gonna still be lower than if you use DOM0 because you parallelize the boot. So you don't have to wait for Linux to boot twice in a sense, but is not gonna be as fast as less than a second, right? That's, but you're gonna get to your critical environment, your critical routine still in less than a second. Um, so, uh, so Unimore developed this and the, 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 the demo by them is gonna show you today a PV network coming up, uh, being used for communication between two VMs uh, in a DOM0-less environment. 
Vertio. So uh, Vertio is similar in, in many ways to, uh, to Xampp drivers in the sense that it was designed for I.O. virtualization. Um, Front-end drivers are available in Linux, BSD, Windows. Uh, they're probably a little bit more widespread compared to XMPV drivers. Also, uh, there are so many RTOSs and uh, proprietary little OSs in embedded that still it might be the case as there is no virtual support at all in the environment you're looking for. The backend in, is typically called VMM, as I mentioned, because in, in a KVM uh, uh, setup, the backend, because it's privileged, doesn't, do, doesn't just do the backend work. It also does virtual machine management tasks, and that's why it's called VMM. Which brings me to the point of um, uh, uniqueness is that backends need to be privileged. So there is work in progress, and we're gonna, I'm going to talk to you about it in a second, about making them unprivileged, but as of today, uh, it is still the case, which are safety implications, security implications, and so on. Um, Xen support is there, so if you want to use Vertio with Xen, it's possible. Uh, you need to use a couple of uh, non-upstream patches, but it's not going to be very difficult to set it up. Uh, but there is no DOM zero less support. I'm going to uh, also go into a little bit more details on why. So the virtual architecture works a bit like this. So virtual from, from the point of view of your, dom, of, of your DOMU, so of your regular VM, looks a lot more like a regular device, like an emulated device. So when the front end try to access uh, the device, it traps into the hypervisor that then sends an IO request, which means an IO emulation request to the backend. So, so something like, please emulate for me this right to address blah. You know, take care of it. Then the backend receives a your request and proceed with the emulation. But to perform the emulation, what it then needs to do is map the page in memory of the front end. And this is where the privilege requirement comes from, because the backend needs to have the ability to map the page of the front end, and it can be any page of the front end, and therefore in its privileges. So, what is upstreaming then? What's missing? The IO REC infrastructure, which is this component here, right, is upstream in the hypervisor. So, you can use it to hook up QEMU, KVM tools, really any emulator you can write your own, as long as you send it an IO request and the emulator will take care of it. It's just as simple as that. Um, that is fully upstream already. What's missing is tool support. So the convenience tool that lets you say, please create a VM for me with Vertio block, that's missing. So the patches to say, create me a Vertio block, that's missing. But there are, it has been sent to the list, so I actually have a link in this presentation. I added many links in this PowerPoint presentation, so uh, I recommend you to go online. You're going to find all of the links of all the missing and work in progress activities right there. And you can fetch a patch and apply to yourself a try it out. So the guys that developed this uh, is EPAM, and they have a Vertio block-based demo running uh, with them. The, there are two interesting um, work-in-progress activities. Uh, one is by Linaro Project Stratos, and that is about uh, making Vertio backend not privileged. So how does it work? So if you go back to here, so the, the idea is to pre-share a bunch of memory between your DOM0 and your purple VM, and then have all the requests, all the emulation requests, from purple always be from that shared memory. And because it's already shared, you, know the, you don't need to explicitly map it any longer. Now, this is gonna work. I mean, it's, it's, it's a simple approach, it's gonna work. What is unknown is the performance implication. And I should say, the performance implication to exist in Vertio protocols. Now, if you were to design a new Vertio protocol with this in mind, you could make it probably as fast as you would like. But an existing Vertio protocol like Vertio Net has been optimized for, year, for years and years by Michael and the other uh, members of the Vertio community to be as fast as it can with memory sharing. Right? And as fast as you can with memory sharing is not the optimization that necessarily works in our favor when you have a memory 
copying interface in there. I, I, when I say memory copy is because the region is pre-shared, what you're going to end up is copying to and from that shared region so that you always fetch from it. So it's going to be more copies involved. So um, I'm not saying this is necessarily going to be a bad performance. I, I it just I, I really mean it's unknown. And it's interesting because with these protocols, and if you ask me at the end what is the performance, it's really hard to tell. Because depending on the configuration, so another key detail, for instance, is are you going to use Bertha your neck to talk outside, like Google.com, or to talk to your neighbor VM. This has a, a very different performance profile. So all these key details have a very big impact, and you can get to 2x, 5x, even 10x performance difference, just depending on the configuration. So it's really hard to tell in advance. The other interesting development is what, what's going to happen with uh, DOM zero-less. So, um, the dumb way to enable it for DOM zero less would be to just wait until the backend here in DOM zero is up and running, and then you can use it. But basically, that effectively synchronizes the boot, serializes the boot, and then you have no real advantage. A better way would be to hot plug the virtual uh, device into your guest when is actually ready the backend. So I think we need some sort of hot plug mechanism to implement this properly. But this at the moment is just exist on a PowerPoint slide and nowhere else. Um, okay, so I think you have heard about this so far, uh, you, even without me having I mean, to tell you about it. Uh, these are, the one I talked to you so, uh, already are existing solution based on device virtualization, based on I.O. virtualization. What I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting into now are two uh, alternatives which are pure VM-to-VM -VM communication mechanism. That if VM-to-VM -VM communication is really your goal and you don't have any I.O. virtualization requirement, it's likely that these are going to be a better, a better fit. The first one is Argo. So Argo was actually born for highly secure environment for VM-to-VM -VM communication in highly secure environments. So the way it works is um, the sender asks the hypervisor, please send this buffer to the receiver. And the hypervisor dat data copies the buffer into the receiver buffer. Why is this highly secure? Because there is a pretty large class of attacks that are all based on the sender trying to change the data under the receiver feed while the receiver is reading it. So when you have a shared memory, the sender plays some memory in the shared memory, and then it says, go, go and read, go and read it. And then the, the receiver go and reads it, and the sender, ha ha, now is gonna try to change the bits and see what happens, right? And you see with pattern and meltdown, even you know, very subtle changes at just at the right time can get arbitrary code execution. So with, the, with Argo, this doesn't happen, because the hypervisor first, it freezes the sender buffer, and then he copies the data. So good luck changing the bits while the uh, hypervisor has frozen the buffer, right? So you cannot change it any longer. Um, Argo, um, so what are the pros and cons? So pros is made for VM to VM communication. Uh, as great performance, is data is memory copy, but has been designed for memory copying. So it's actually pretty fast. Um, uh, what else? It's lightweight. So, is because it's a, simply, it's a simple send and receiver architecture, uh, it's, it's a lot more lightweight compared to um, uh, the other I.O. virtualization solutions. It still requires two drivers, uh, which is also the main cons of using Argo. So it, it requires two drivers, one for event, to receive and send event, that is the event, event channel driver, one of the PV driver blocks components, there are BSD implementation available, and it's pretty widespread. There are Linux, Windows, uh, um, BSD is available already upstream for event, for event channels. And then there is the Argo driver. So the Argo driver, what it does, it manages the, the receiver buffer. So it manages the receiver buffer and gives you API to fetch the data from the receiver buffer. Um, they are overall a lot smaller than, I think, a full I.O. virtualization solution, but still, it's some code. It's not zero code there that will need to be ported to an Artos, let's say, if you wanted to. There are BSD uh, implementation available for both. Um, uh, the zero-less enablement is really straightforward here because there is no backend. 
there is no front end. There's just a sender and a receiver. They start basically at the same time. So it, the enablement was trivial. So I have to thank Alec, uh, Alec Kwapis from Donnerwork. Uh, and what, what he did is he wrote a patch for Linux to enable event channel for, uh, for Linux. And that was all it took, 10 lines or 20 lines, all it took to enable Argo in a DOM zero-less uh, environment. So it's, it's a pretty good match. And uh, now I go to, uh, to the, maybe the simplest possible, or the two, the two last two uh, are the simplest possible mechanism that you can use. If you only need VM to VM communication, maybe the easiest thing you can actually do is to set up a shared memory between your VMs and just set up a ring buffer. So that's gonna be as easy as it gets. Um, it's gonna be portable, it's gonna work with any OS, um, it's going to be, uh, there's not going to be any complex driver that you need to port to QNX, right? This is going to work basically with virtually any environment that you can imagine. The other advant advantage is if you need to statically define the VM to VM communication channel, this is statically defined. This is actually the only one that is statically defined among all of the ones that I mentioned so far because Argo, I should say, the pros and cons of Argo is this is dynamic. Now, you can add restriction on who talks to who with a, there is a, there is a framework in Xen called XSM that's basically like SC Linux. So you can add restriction, but still is fundamentally a dynamic channel. While here, if you have a requirement on static, this is static, right? It doesn't get any more static than that. So the only thing that's not upstream is, um, I added a patch which is on the list which you can use, it's quite simple, and that is a hypercall to inject interrupts in another VM. And this is just for simplicity. You could, do, you could use other mechanisms, you could use physical interrupts if you can, uh, you could use event channels, but why bother when you can just call an, an hypercall and inject an, an interrupt? So that makes the enablement of this even easier um, uh, everywhere. So you just need an interrupt controller driver pretty much. Performance. So this can be incredibly fast if designed right. I cannot, I cannot stress this more, if designed right, right? If you design it badly, now it's up to you. It's up to, we, are, we, are, we are only giving you the shared memory. So if you, if, you, if you use a wrong library, if you set up a wrong ring buffer, if you miss an update on your ring buffer pointer, this is not gonna go right. Okay, it can be slow, right? But as a person that designed one of these protocols, I can tell you that if you design it right, it can be even the fastest among all of them because you can design it for your own data, knowing the data pattern, the sending and receiving pattern on your specific application. None of the other can claim that, right? So, of course, theoretically, this can be the, the fastest, I think. The last is an honorable, honorable mention because you cannot use it yet, but at Xanix we are working on a programmable logic way to solve this problem. We are a programmable logic company after all, so we think that PL is obviously the right solution for this problem, right? Um, and uh, so you could today actually uh, deploy in programmable logic two simple network devices with a simple switch in the middle, assign one network de device here, a network device there, and you, you have your full network uh, infrastructure in programmable logic ready to go. This works, but it's not very performant. Um, so what we are working on is a specialized data mover made on purpose for VM-to-VM -VM communication that can be as fast as possible and easy to use. When I say easy to use, I mean, with no complex driver, no uh, device virtualization, no stuff that you need to port to, v to OSs, a very, very simple enablement as, as, as small as possible, directly in user space. The kernel or hypervisor size is going to be either zero or tiny because the, the, the sender and the receiver buffer are going to be exposable directly in user space. And it's going to be fast and ideally tiny in terms of code size. That's the goal, it's not ready yet, so maybe next year I hope to be able to uh, show you a demo of, of this. Um, and of course the main cons is that you need programmable logic. Okay, so um, I have a summary slide and um, really the conclusion here is not to tell you that any of these is the best, it's to tell you that there is no one size fit all 
solution among them. And we can draw some, I can help you draw some uh, conclusions, but there is no, certainly no winner, right? Um, first of all, it's good that there are so many options, right? So just a year ago, there wouldn't be as many options. And if you look at the upstream status wisdom zero less column, three out of four, they are, it's possible to use them today if you go home you know, uh, and, and try them out. Well, I should say, except for the XMPV driver that I'm gonna demo today, but the patches are not public. But we aim at making them public by the end of the year. So by the end of the year, you're gonna have three among these four options available for them zero less. And in a traditional Xen setup, all four are already available. So, I think that's pretty good in terms of choice. Now, the other important thing to recognize is, what is your requirement? Are you just looking for a VM-to-VM -VM communication mechanism? Because if you're looking for a VM-to-VM -VM communication mechanism, you're likely best off with a VM-to-VM -VM communication solution. And, the, and among these, Argo and uh, plain share memory interrupts are uh, the, certainly the, the, the two that fit the bill. On the other end, if you need an IO virtualization solution, then uh, it might be possible, I mean, both ways, you can use a VM to VM communication framework to do IO virtualization if you roll your own, right? You have to basically build on top of a simple communication channel a full virtualized IO device. You could do that. But alternatively, you can use a device virtualization solution like Send PV Network for communication. Also, it wasn't really designed for that. So both, you know, you can do, but I think obviously if you have uh, a IO virtualization requirement, you're likely better off with an IO virtualization solution. If you have VM-to-VM -VM communication requirement, you're likely better off with a VM-to-VM -VM communication solution. Um, the compatibility here uh, that you see on the, on, on the compatibility column, uh, so, um, it's pretty wide. I think the one that you have to watch, I, th I think is a little bit more restrictive, is Argo, uh, because um, as, as, as it's ported at the moment to fewer OSs, but at the same time, the code size and the number of drivers is a lot smaller, because it's a smaller and, and a more lightweight solution. So at the end of the day, it might be that it's still easier uh, to enable than the other. Performance, this is a dreaded question. Um, it's really hard to tell, as I was, uh, as I was mentioning. Um, if deployed right, they can be all very performant. Uh, if deployed badly, they can all be um, not great in terms of numbers. So th there is a XMPV protocol that is very fast for VM to VM to communication, which is called PV calls. And that's based on memory copy. It's actually maybe the only one that's based on memory copying. It's a big green. It only supports TCP and IPv4, but that is, is incredibly fast. Um, Vertionet is known to be very fast if, if you can have privileged backends, of course. Instead, if you cannot have privileged backends, it's a question mark. Um, Argo is good. Argo is definitely good. Uh, and I don't, I, I don't have recent numbers in comparison with something like PV calls, but probably it's close. Uh, and that also is based on memory copying. Plain memory and, and uh, plain share memory, as I told you, it really depends on how you develop it. How many processors are you gonna use to write to that memory? Are you gonna use just one process, two processes? Four, eight, you know, how many cores are you gonna employ to do memory copies on, to, to, on the shared memory, right? So it's, it's difficult to tell in advance, but it can, be, it can be the fastest or the slowest depending on how you implement it. And in regards to unprivileged backends, so again, uh, the only one that has privileged backend requirement today and is a work in progress, the solution by Project Stratos from Linaro is Vertio. All the others don't require privileged backends. Well, Argo and, and shared memory don't have backends at all, right? So, so there is no privileged backends. Uh, so, um, yeah, so not one size fit all. So it, Xen PV drivers, if you're looking for IO virtualization and you don't want to have or you cannot have privileged backends, it's probably the best option. Uh, Argo, if you just want to do VM to VM communication, dynamic channel are okay. Argo is give you higher API. So Argo give you a user space Linux API to do send buffer, receive buffer. It's a lot easier and it's already done compared to do your pre-share memory and then to set up your own library. 
uh, shared memory, of course, for iOS compatibility, that is going to work everywhere. Like, so if you're worried about getting it to run on your strange OS that somebody else chose for you, that's going to work. Um, and the last, uh, I think, I think Vertio, it, it's probably the one with the largest amount of virtual devices, classes of virtual devices available, such as, I think there is a 3D graphic Vertio uh, front end and back end. So if you need 3D graphic virtualization, uh, then maybe it's easiest to start from there that is already available. Demo. So the demo has been developed by um, uh, Unimore University in Italy by Luca Miccio and Marco Solieri. Uh, so the demo, uh, it works like this. It's just a traditional uh, DOM zero less setup. In this case, for simplicity, for simplicity, it's not recommended, but it's also the very first demo of this technology. But we only have a DOM zero and a DOM U, so we don't, we don't have a true DOM zero less setup without DOM zero, or with a DOM zero that the only thing it does is set up something and then quits. So the, so the front end and back end here are going to set up with the back end in DOM zero. Um, and, but it, it's, after all, it's, a, it's just a proof of concept, so you can easily do this the same way as I, as I showed earlier with three VMs and DOM zero, basically just active at the beginning and then maybe even quitting altogether uh, if you don't need it. Um, and let me switch to the demo right now. So we are going to see um, two VMs started in parallel with DOM zero-less. First being loaded uh, from U-boot. This is a U-boot prompt, by the way, on Axalinx Zinc MP board. So it's TFTPing all the required binaries. And then you're going to see a lot of messages on the console. First then, and then a lot of messages on the console because both domains are printing out at the same time on the same console, so it's a bit messy. Um, and we're going to finish out the um, DOM0 boot. This is the, the other domain saying hello, as you see. They are both printing out on the console at the same time. By default, you get uh, access to the DOM0 serial. You can see that there are two domains running. This is DOM0, uh, this is DOM zero so you have Excel, the privilege command interface uh, where you can create VMs. You can switch to, to, to domain one, and then this is domain one. Uh, you have no Excel, there is no uh, privilege utilities in there. It's just your regular unprivileged environment. It's also Linux. You do Excel list and no, you know, it's not there, no, no wonder. We switch back to DOM0. Is control triple A, by the way, that's the key, uh, the sequence of keys to switch. And on DOM0, we initialize PVNet. Now, obviously, in production, you're not going to do this by hand, right? You're going to do this automatically. This is done by hand to show you that it's a separate additional step, and this is a demo, right? Uh, to show you what's happening. Now, normally, instead of uh, you know, running by hand that script, you would just run it from your init system automatically as soon as possible. Now, the network now is available in both your DOM0 and, and DOM U, as uh, it has been initialized. So there is a bridge that is required in order to be able to connect uh, to, the for, to the outside network and has also been created. As you can see, XNBR0 is present among the list of bridges. We switch to domain one, and now you, we can just use SSH to get into DOM0, right? Or you could even ping Google or do whatever you like because the PV network connection is available. And you see there is a, a S0 interface, and that's from PV network being uh, hot plugged into your uh, DOM0 less DOM U. We have an IP address.
and we'll SSH into DOM0 um, just as a test, just to, just to showcase a, a possible connection uh, between DOMU and DOM0. So. And that's it. We are logging into DOM0, and now we are in DOM0. That's the end. And Excel list works, and uh, we have the privilege interface. Um, OK, I think this is the, uh, this is the end. Uh, so do you guys have any questions? We still have five minutes, so uh, please ask. So in a normal in a normal environment in a, in a regular setup, let me go back to at the beginning. Right in a regular setup, what happens is you boot Zen start Zen, Zen start DOM zero, then yellow and purple is not there yet, not existing, and then in DOM zero you do Excel create, uh, and a new VM is created with a network available straight off the bat. But that's because you are from DOM0, you have all the tools, the backend is already up and running, so of course it's going to work. While now we are parallelized the boot, that means the backend is not necessarily there. You don't know when the backend is going to be there. You know, they're starting all in parallel. Now, thankfully, uh, by happy coincidence, Zen PV driver were actually designed with a rendezvous protocol. So they can start in parallel, they can find each other, but still you need somebody to create the initial connection, like ad the equivalent of ad advertising the device on a PCI bus to say, hey, there is something there. So in order to create that connection, um, we need DOM0 or something like DOM0. You could probably do it from maybe Xen directly, or, or you could do it from DOM0 and then kill DOM0 because it's really not necessary any longer, or even maybe from the back end. But yeah, so, so what we're doing is we are starting yellow and purple in parallel with DOM0, and when DOM0 is up and running, create the connection, and then the connection is there, and DOM0 is no more in the picture. Now, for the demo, DOM0 is in the picture just because we place the back end in there for convenience, right? Uh, but uh, it doesn't have to be there. So the back end in, in this case is here, should not be here, could be in another VM. Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's definitely not an architectural requirement. Okay. Yeah. We, we have a proof of concept. No, we are more than, we are, it's more than an idea. We have a proof, of, a proof of concept. We have even numbers, okay? It's just that the interface is not as good as uh, we would like yet. So, um, the, so, it's, so the idea is there is a component in programmable logic with multiple interfaces, multiple uh, interfaces to send and multiple interfaces to receive. And then you give a sender interface to one VM and the receiver interface to the other VM then the sender VM uses this physical, like this hardware uh, queue to NQ request saying copy this stuff. Uh, and then the receiver interface can be used to say uh, extract this data. And then the, the data mover does a copy uh, and is as fast as, as you can imagine because it's done straight in hardware, right? Um, and uh, the reason why uh, I haven't showed you more detail here is that the interfaces are still work in progress. So at the moment, we still requires quite a bit of code change in Zen, quite a bit of code change in Linux. Uh, there are still some active weights here and there, so it's not quite ready for prime time, but it will be, I mean, I'm pretty sure. So it's, it's, it's not just, you know, a crazy idea, you know, that maybe somebody somewhere one day will implement. So, yeah, probably, even just in six months, we'll have something more concrete, yeah. Any more questions? Okay, in that case, uh, thank you all for attending, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk, and uh, have a good rest of the conference. Thank you.